So this lecture is on the later Wittgenstein, um, and I'm a little anxious about it because Wittgenstein is a cult figure. Um, that is, he's one of these philosophers that people just, they don't just read his philosophy and say, well, it's got some pros and cons. You, you become a Wittgensteinian, or at least it seems to be that way for a lot of people. Um, apparently he was very much a sort of cult leader figure in, uh, in reality. Uh, he, um, he acquired a following uh, when he lectured at Cambridge, um, and those students of his sort of went forth into the world and, and spread his ideas in, you know, like apostles of Jesus. Um, and he, a very he was a very strange man. Um, he, uh, if you look at his life, he fought for the Germans in World War I, uh, got captured by the Allies and was working on his first um, major work, which is the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which is sort of the apotheosis of the Frege Russell view of language. Um, reading that is very hard. It's, it's written in a very austere style, but it, it's structured uh, very uh, precisely. Uh, Wittgenstein was actually trained as a, an architect originally, and there is a house that you can visit, I think in Vienna, um, because he was Austrian, that uh, uh, he, he designed, and it, it's very, very sort of precise and austere itself. So as a, an architect, his, um, his sort of tastes are evident in the Tractatus uh, Logico-Philosophicus. So that's supposed to be sort of the, the classic example of what's called the early Wittgenstein, which is where he, uh, he first went to meet Frege. Frege told him, you, you seem smart, go study with Russell. He goes and studies with Russell, and, and Russell decides, uh, hey, this guy's a genius. And uh, um, he writes the Tractatus, and then he thinks that basically the Tractatus says all there needs to be said in philosophy. He sort of ended philosophy, and therefore no more philosophy needs to be done. So he sort of went off and did other things, kind of disastrously. He was an elementary school teacher and used to hit the children and things like this. Um, and then he sort of drifted back into philosophy when he started questioning the ideas of the Tractatus. Uh, and it's this philosophy that rejects the earlier philosophy, although as, uh, as you can tell from your reading, there's, there's some threads that continue throughout the entire philosophy. It's not like he gives up everything that he originally believed. Um, his view of the role of philosophy pretty much remained the same um, from the Tractatus to the later work. And it's not a, it's a smaller role for philosophy. The, the most famous quote from the later philosophy about this is, the philosopher's treatment of a question is like the treatment of an illness. And the aim of philosophy is to show the fly at the way out of the fly bottle. What's a fly bottle? But anyway, it's a bottle that a fly is inside. Um, and this is a, there's a similar idea in the Tractatus that uh, the philosopher's job is to sort of reveal where mistakes are made. So philosophical puzzles on this view are just a result of misunderstandings about the way language is used. So there's no deep philosophical puzzle, as most philosophers believe. There's just, oh, I've been using words wrong. And when I understand the true nature of, of the appropriate way to use language, I will, the, the, the puzzle will somehow disappear. So it's as if philosophy isn't really engaging directly with the world, is, um, seems to be a consistent thread. And this is part of what is called the linguistic turn 
of 20th century philosophy, that uh, you know, language is the key focus and philosophers aren't really dealing with the world. Um, so that remained a theme, but otherwise uh, just about everything changed in the later philosophy, including and most obviously the method of doing philosophy and the pr method of presenting ideas. Because the Tractatus, even though it's a very forbidding work, is a very kind of precise, ordered work. There's a structure to it. It has sort of seven key uh, paragraphs and then parenthet and then subparagraphs. It's like the structure of a computer program. We have seven key things and then a bunch of subroutines attached to each, each of the seven. Um, so it, it has this very precise structure. Whereas the later work, uh, which is collected in a bunch of places and, and was never published during Wittgenstein's uh, life. Um, the only work that was published in his life was the Tractatus. And then the later work, he was going to publish uh, the, the, the major work of his later, uh, later period, which is called Philosophical Investigations. Uh, and then he, he decided against it uh, and never published it during his lifetime. And there's other important works that were just collected by students. There's uh, something called the Blue Book, which is one of the earlier works of his later philosophy, which is just notes dictated to students. And then the Brown Book, so-called because it had a brown, the notebook in which these notes were written down had a brown cover is a slightly later version which is more like the philosophical investigations. Then there's a bunch of other papers. So there's voluminous writings but they were never published and they, they've sort of come out in dribs and drabs afterwards, uh, usually brought to publication by his, his acolytes, by these people who, uh, who followed him and uh, you know, regarded him as, as basically giving the truth about philosophy. And if you've seen a photo of him, he does look like a cult leader. He's got this incredibly intense stare. And uh, apparently, I, I, I saw a prof, uh, professor once who'd, who'd seen him speak, and apparently he used to, he, there was something called the Wittgenstein slump. He would lean on a lectern like this, you know, as if tortured by the, the, the great ideas that were inside his brain fighting to come out. Uh, so very charismatic. I, oddly a very charismatic figure given that he seems almost certainly autistic uh, and was very kind of um, antisocial. You know, he, he went off to uh, isolated places to do his work. He wasn't, he wasn't a clubbable guy, you know, he wasn't out partying or anything like that. He was very much a loner, but at the same time when he encountered other people he had this massive effect on them. Um, so the reason I'm nervous about this is because uh, there are these sort of battles about interpreting him, in particular because, as I was, as I was saying, the later writings are very fragmentary. Um, there are a lot of, I find them a little bit annoying um, in that they're very easy for someone to find them deep because there's these little uh, short passages that are full of vivid uh, examples, although I find them, the examples rather artificial, but they're, they're vivid examples and they, they sort of make you view the world a different way and you can, it, you can have what seems like kind of a religious conversion reading that, but it's also the case that they are open because he doesn't present his ideas in a structured argument and say, as you're supposed to do. When you learn to write philosophy papers, you're supposed to learn how to present it clearly, ideally present your argument as premise, 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 conclusion, you know, and then say, well, this is my most controversial premise, let me defend it against objections, that kind of thing. Nothing like that. And that's on purpose because he thinks that that kind of approach to philosophy is the problem and that there that, uh, that philosophy as part of language use is very fragmentary and, and doesn't have a sort of uh, single essence. And in sort of rejecting all of the, the kind of 
uh, uh, approach to philosophy that is epitomized by Bertrand Russell, he goes very far the other way and presents his arguments in, they're not really arguments, they're just sort of um, vivid passages. But having said that, lots of philosophers have read him and said, well, you can extract from that arguments. Uh, and, and in fact, there's something called the private language argument that is perhaps more fought over than any part of Wittgenstein. And it's called the argument, even though he never calls it that and it doesn't really look like an argument. Uh, okay, so I am not an expert on Wittgenstein. There are many people who are experts on Wittgenstein and probably anything I say is going to, if, if they deigned to listen to me saying it, they would get very angry. So bear that in mind. And uh, if you find this interesting, seek out somebody who, who knows a lot more what they're talking about. But here's a, a, an essential introduction. And I think a good way to frame this, which Wittgenstein sort of does in the philosophical investigations, is as a contrast to the old way of doing things. Now, he talks sometimes in the investigations about the author of the Tractatus. You know, he doesn't say me, he doesn't say my old ideas. He talks about the author of the Tractatus as if there's, that's an, a, a different person. And perhaps he feels like it is because his ideas have changed so much. But instead of actually tackling major figures like Fre uh, Russell, who was, you know, his friend and teacher uh, for a, a, a large number of years. I, I don't know what happened to them in their later years, whether they had a falling out, but, um, but instead of sort of directly targeting sort of more recent figures, he talks, he takes a passage from St. Augustine, the, you know, um, pre-medieval, uh, Christian philosopher, where he talks about uh, language acquisition. And he says, and, and probably uh, his idea in talking about Augustine is to play up how sort of ancient and embedded in philosophy these ideas about language are, because they're here, you know, they, they've been around for nearly 2,000 years. Um, so, it's all the more momentous that Wittgenstein is saying they've got it all wrong, that they should be abandoned. So uh, this is the sort of Augustinian picture, but it's um, also largely the picture in uh, the Tractatus. And remember the Tractatus was very influential on the Vienna Circle, the logical positivists and those guys. So Wittgenstein is interesting in that he sort of pre predates the logical positivists and influences them and then presents a view that totally rejects their approach. Okay, so let's take a look at this contrast. So Augustine presents this view of, because uh, uh, Augustine in the Confessions, it's a sort of biography. It's one of the, the first autobiographies, the first most famous autobiographies. And he describes his childhood remembering how he acquired language, you know, which is a pretty weird. People don't usually start that young, but he describes it. And he says, I remember my elders pointing to things and telling me the word, you know, so chair, table, apple, that kind of thing. Uh, and this is sort of the common sense view of how language is acquired. Now, it's interesting that Wittgenstein talks about this um, because the, the, the approach to meaning that Frege and Russell uh, have taken up to this point is to focus strictly on language itself. How do words mean? And it, talking about the relationship between uh, words and the world. Whereas immediately Wittgenstein says, uh, in order to understand meaning, you have to look at how people acquire the meanings of words. So one of the uh, major insights or uh, innovations, perhaps, of the later Wittgenstein is to shift the focus onto people. And 
In this respect, of course, he was very influential on mid 20th century philosophy. We've already seen people like Grice talk about speaker's meaning uh, and focus on human beings as the sort of uh, locus of meaning rather than looking at language. Well, all of that uh, is part of, it was sort of in the air, but if anyone was the key driving force in this focus on human practices, uh, it's Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein's ideas, even before they were circulated, uh, people knew, you know, people were talking to Wittgenstein, he was talking about these ideas. And he was starting talking about this quite early on, like uh, 30s and early 40s. He, he died in 51, I think, um, but by that time he was well into the, the late period. The, uh, the late period started to happen in the 30s. Okay, so the Augustinian picture says that you basically pick up language word by word. So you start with no words, you pick up, uh, then you pick up one word, and then you pick up another until gradually, you know, you pick up lots of words. So the unit of meaning is the word. Uh, for Wittgenstein, that is completely wrong. That is, the unit, uh, words individually in isolation from practices are meaningless. They're, they're just sounds. The only, the only sense in which a word can have meaning is as part of what he calls a language game. Uh, and before we get into language games, because this is a, a key concept of Wittgenstein's that has been very influential, um, I think one of the most telling um, parts of Wittgenstein, and perhaps the sort of gateway into his, um, his different way of viewing language is his criticisms of ostensive definitions. Okay, ostensive definition is a fancy way of saying that. So an ostensive definition is when I define a word by literally pointing. So an ostensive definition of apple would be to say the word apple and point at an apple. And that's how we think to this day that babies or infants learn words because we think we've taught, you know, how does the baby know what a ball is? Well, I taught the baby by saying ball and pointing to the ball. So we think ostensive definition is the, uh, the gateway to language acquisition. And Wittgenstein, I think convincingly, says, this cannot be right because um, think about what you must already know for an ostensive definition to work. You have to understand what is going on in the game of ostensive definition. That is, you've got to know how it works. You've got to know that when somebody does this, you don't just look at the finger. I mean, if you try and do ostensive definitions to a dog or a cat, they're just going to sniff your finger. They don't get what's going on. Whereas it seems to be that when ostensive definition is successful, it's because people already know, oh, I know what you're doing, so I know how to use this um, activity to acquire new information. But you have to understand the activity, you have to understand, and it's quite complicated if you think about it, because uh, for one thing, it's not this finger that you need to put out. You need to sort of do an invisible dotted line going from the end of my finger that keeps going until it hits some middle-sized object. But even then, you don't know what aspect of the object is being referred to. I mean, uh, as Wittgenstein says, if I point at a a brown table and I say table, how does the child know that they mean the object rather than brown or rather than corner or rather than, you know, furniture or something like that? It's amazingly complicated. You have to have all of this shared, all of these shared assumptions with the person teaching you for them to be able to teach you at all. Um, so you cannot say 
that you start with nothing and then suddenly you acquire the meaning of a word. Because you don't start with nothing, you have to understand the activity for, to be able to learn the word. And the ostensive definition is an example of a game. Now, when he says game, this is one of the, the famous passages in Wittgenstein when he uses, and it, it's an analogy or a metaphor, um, as so much of uh, Wittgenstein is. But this is one of the famous examples from Wittgenstein, if I can find the quote, where he talks about um, games as a metaphor. Uh, games illustrate this property uh, that he calls family resemblance. And when he talks about family resemblance, he is rejecting a standard practice in philosophy. So a standard practice in philosophy, dating back to Socrates, is to seek, when you seek the meaning of a word, you say that the word has an essence and the essence can be captured with a definition that lists necessary and sufficient conditions. So, you know, obviously something like bachelor, uh, what does bachelor mean? Well, uh, uh, you learn what it means by beginning a definition that lists necessary and sufficient conditions. In order to be a bachelor, you have to be, it's necessary that you be a man and it's necessary that you be uh, unmarried and those two conditions together are sufficient to make you a bachelor. That's a classic example of a definition. But um, games and, uh, are a good illustration of something that cannot be defined in this way. And he thinks that so much of life is much more like this. He says, consider the proceedings we call games. I mean board games, card games, ball games, Olympic games, and so on. What is common to them all? Don't say there must be something common or they would not be called games, but look and see. Pause there to note that Wittgenstein does this a lot in his later work. He's, uh, because he's um, fighting something that he thinks is really ingrained in your way of thinking, uh, he says, look, don't, don't go by your assumptions. Try and put your assumptions to one side and start afresh and look and see. Don't assume that there must be something in common with games because otherwise we wouldn't use the word games to refer to them all. Uh, that's, that's assuming this view that concepts all have this hidden essence uh, that we can get at, that a good definition or that philosophy will bring us closer to. Uh, forget that. Just look at games. Look and see whether there is something in common to them. For if you look at them, you will not see something that is in common to all, but similarities, relationships, and a whole series of them at that. This is family resemblance. Uh, that's another analogy. So games is an analogy, and family resemblance is another analogy, the analogy being with a family. I mean, if you, you can see two children, neither of whom look alike, but both of whom look like their parents. So you, can, so you can connect one child to the other child by saying that child looks like the parents, they've got the eyes and nose, and the parents look like that child. So you can link uh, one child to another, even though they don't actually resemble each other. They've got, and if you do this you know, to the edges of the family, you might have two people that look nothing in common, maybe have different racial categories, maybe, you know, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to say anything in common, but you can, put, you can connect them as part of the same family because this one is connected to this one who's connected to this one who's connected to this one who's connected to this one. And he says that's true of games, that's true of language games. So what that does is rid him of the obligation to give you a clear definition. And in fact, he's not going to do that. That's what uh, the, the methodology of the later Wittgenstein avoids, all of that kind of... Uh, trying to get closer to a hidden essence. So, language games are practices. So, uh, one of the things about the Tractatus is it's trying to get at the structure of language. It's, it's trying to say language works like this, I've laid bare the structure of it. 
and it's calculus-like. That is, it's the structure of language is like the structure of logic, it's like the structure of math. There are clear-cut rules and a clear-cut structure. I have revealed the hidden structure of it. I mean, and that's what Russell, for example, is trying to do in building up uh, the language of logic, that there's supposed to be a clearer and better version of, uh, of language. But as many people have pointed out, even when logic is successful at what it does, it only captures one part of language, that is, the part of language that is to do with um, making claims about the world. Logic doesn't deal with questions, with orders, with uh, speech acts like promises. It just is, deals with truth and falsity. So already critics of the Russell view say, well, you're just capturing part of language. And Wittgenstein takes this idea and runs with it and says there is no single thing, language, that has an essence that can be revealed. There's all of these language games that are connected and in fact, you can have two different language games that use the same word. And one mistake that you can make is take a word that is being used as part of one language game and assume that it, because it's the same word, it, 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 the rules for its use in another language game are the same. But they're not. This is like saying, you know, you can use, remember that board game, Sorry? Um, where, uh, and the, the pieces for that look like pawns. And it, it would be to assume that because it's the same piece, it's a pawn, that it moves exactly the same way in both games. No, it's just a coincidence that they look the same across the two different games. You, they certainly don't use them in the same way. So that would be one example of solving a problem. Oh. I see why you're having this problem not under, why you're, you're confronting this apparent paradox. It's because you're taking a word that uh, is used one way in a game and uh, in one game and used another way in another and you're assuming that there's some rules, uh, there's some commonality between these two things. No, those are two different language games. And he lists language games like asking questions, telling stories, playing, play acting, singing, guessing riddles, making jokes, solving problems. These are all activities that are language games and they don't have a common structure. Okay, how does a word have meaning? By denotation. That's the idea of uh, the Frege-Russell idea. Of course, Frege also has sense, but um, denotation is the meaning of the word Apple is the thing itself. Uh, Wittgenstein says no. And in this sense, he sort of severs language from um, the physical world. It doesn't attach to the world. It does, in the um, Tractatus, he had a picture theory of language, that it depicts the world. So it, there was this close connection between language and it's supposed to picture the world. That's where truth comes in. Truth is, you know, a true statement is one where the language reflects the reality. But in this idea of meaning as use, that is the meaning of a word is its use in a language game, uh, we've lost that connection. So the, the soul, what captures the entirety of the meaning of a word, is understanding the rules for its use in a language game. Um, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, the other thing is that language is self-contained. So in one sense, language is, uh, the later Wittgenstein severs language from talking about the physical world. But in another sense, language is bound up with the rest of social life. So it's removed from talking about non-human physical world, but it is embedded deeply in uh, social life, um, everything that humans do. So it's not a self-contained thing, so that you can just say, I'm just looking at language, I'm not looking at customs, I'm not, looking, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm a linguist. That's consistent with this view. Whereas with this view, no. Um, language and uh, all other aspects of human so social life are all bound up 
And this is where you come across the Wittgensteinian phrase, form of life. So a form of life, of course, Wittgenstein doesn't give a clear definition of it, because that's not what he does. That's not, that's not how the later Wittgenstein rolls. Um, a form of life just seems to be, well, it's uh, uh, anthropologists, anthropologists, by the way, love Wittgenstein um, for reasons that will become obvious. But what an anthropologist might say is a culture. That is, it's a set of practices, set of assumptions, something that a, a group can share uh, and it, uh, uh, it shapes their approach to life, the way they view the world. Um, so the structure of language uh, in the Tractatus has a hidden essence that, you can, that philosophy will take us closer to. Whereas the phrase that Wittgenstein uses about language is that it lies open to view. And you've got to, it's a bit like, um, here's an analogy of my own. Uh, if you've ever looked at kids' paintings or kids' drawings, they all do a bunch of things that are clearly mistaken, but they make the same mistakes. So for example, early kids' pictures, there's the sky is at the top of the picture, blue, always blue, the ground is at the bottom, green, and then there's this big space between that is neither sky nor ground. What, what's that about? What, what is that? It seems to be empty void, but all kids' pictures do that. And the world isn't like that. So where are they getting this from? It's as if they're projecting, they have, what, what they're drawing is not an actual, not what a camera could do, would do. In other words, kids don't operate the way that cameras do, which is just take the world is and bam, there it is, give you, give you a, a representation of it. They are trying to represent the world, but they're representing it with symbols rather than direct depiction. So this, it's as if the, the sky at the top is a symbol. Another thing that kids all do is if they draw people with hats, they draw the entire head and then they draw the hat on top of the head. It's as if the hat is filled with something and it's just teetering on the top of them. They don't, the hat doesn't come down an obscure part of the head. They draw it on top of the hat. You know, uh, if you've never seen kids' pictures, take a look, they all do this. And um, if you're really bad at art and you, you want to learn how to do better art, one of the tricks that art teachers do is they say, okay, uh, I want you to draw uh, this picture. So they have a picture of something and then they turn it upside down so that you don't know what it is. And then they say, draw that. And when you don't know what something is, you will much more closely depict it because you're not saying, oh, I know what that is, it's, it's this thing, and I have the symbol for this thing, and I will draw the symbol. That's where we get the problem because you're not drawing what's there, you're drawing the symbol. Um, so they try and break you by making you just uh, see it as a set of colors and lines that you then reproduce, and you're able to do a much better job of depicting it because you don't know what it is. Um, and I think that's an analogy for uh, what, the, what Wittgenstein is trying to do here. He's trying to say, uh, and why he keeps saying, look and see. Don't just, um, don't say there must be something common or they would not be called games. Look and see. So he's saying that the puzzles that we have are as a result of these built-in attitudes that we have that are very ingrained. And I'm trying to break you of that and I'm trying to, to get you to look at what's really there and depict it ex uh, accurately. And when you do that, your philosophical problems will dissolve. Um, okay, so uh, Augustine describes, you know, learning by ostensive definition. We've already learned why that is impossible because, you know, you'd have to acquire the language game 
uh, of, of first. And ostensive definition comes up in discussions of pain and mental states. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, the way you actually learn language is by being immersed in a form of life. You, you pick up the rules for use. So you learn a word when you can use it. The meaning of, a of an expression is, uh, comes from understanding, but understanding, and this, on this Wittgenstein is very insistent, is not a mental process. Understanding, uh, he says this is, a this is a misunderstanding that philosophers have. They think understanding is like something that happens in your mind, like feeling pain or something like that. But he says, look, uh, if you look at the way understanding works, it's not like feeling pain. Feeling pain, you can say, when did the pain start? When did it stop? Um, where did it feel like it was? None of those things make sense when you say, we don't say, how long did you understand the meaning of that word? When did the understanding start? When did it stop? Um, same, uh, understanding a word is just like understanding how to play chess. So it's, it's having an ability. And the way you understand a word, so you can understand words, but you can't understand words before you are embedded in a form of life. So the words come second. The meaning of the words is secondary to understanding the, the context in which they're embedded. That's the other way from Augustine. Augustine says, you know, you build up language word by word. You can say, that kid knows two words and that's the totality of their language. No, that's not how it works for Wittgenstein. You have to understand the language game and then the words make sense as uh, uh, in the context of that. So you know how to use it. Um, somebody, you know that somebody knows how to, uh, uh, knows a word, knows the meaning of a word when they use it correctly. How do you know they're using it correctly? Because you're embedded in the form of life too. It's, um, it's like, uh, when you go to a new school or something, or you go to a, another part of the country, uh, like if you've never lived in the South and you move to the Deep South, you feel like a complete outsider until a few months have passed, and then without really realizing it, you say, oh, I get how things are done here. How did you get it? You, you were slowly marinated in the customs. You just without really realizing it, you, you, until now you know when to say this, when to do this, that, you know, you don't swear as much down in the South, but, you know, uh, saying things that sound um, nice in another part of the country are actual subtle put-downs in the South. You pick up all of those nuances without really realizing it. Um, you learn how things are done. That's exactly analogous to learning how words mean. So knowing the use of a word is having an ability, like uh, it's like knowing how to use a pawn in chess. You have an ability. Now this, is, um, this involves following a rule. But Wittgenstein in the, uh, in the investigations offers an analysis of rule following that contrasts with rule following in the Augustinian picture, because they talk about rules too. I mean, the early Wittgenstein talks about rule, rules too, but the analysis of what it is to follow a rule is very different. Rules and rule following is very distinctive in the later Wittgenstein, and it is the subject of a huge amount of literature and, and disagreement. So anything I say again is going to seem as sup, uh, simplistic or wrong to a, a lot of people. Um, but he certainly says that it, uh, learning how to follow a rule isn't like reading a rule and having a, a reading a rule and saying, oh, this is the rule, huh, I understand it now, I've got a little definition in my head so I can know if I'm following a rule by sort of doing a mental checklist. Am I, am I following the rule? Let's look at the definition of the rule. No, that's absolutely not what's happening when you follow a rule. 
you don't, uh, rule following is done unreflectively. You can follow a rule without it. Whereas in the, the view of rule following in the Augustinian picture is that to follow a rule, uh, you, uh, certain kinds of behavior doesn't count as following a rule. You have to know you're following a rule to be following a rule. Whereas rule following in, um, in the philosophical investigations is done in unreflectively because the rule is constituted by uh, repetitive collective use. As he, um, Grayling quotes Wittgenstein as saying that agreement and uh, rule are cousins, as it were. Uh, where, you learn, um, where you learn the use of one, you have learned the other. Um, so, uh, and, and the other aspect to, to this is that um, rule following it has to be repetitive, as he says. The application of the concept following a, a rule um, presupposes a custom. Uh, hence, it would be nonsense to say just once in the history of the world someone followed a rule. So, rule uh, following is constituted by repetitive collective use. So rules themselves are embedded in um, collective social life. And he gives an example of a signpost and he says, you can think of a signpost as it seems to be a good symbol for a rule in that it's, you know, it's like a, a, an obvious thing that stands out. But if you think about it, the way a signpost works is simply because of our collective agreement to have it do that. Because in a culture that didn't have signs, signs would just be like weird objects. They, they don't, by their very nature, compel people to do uh, or, or guide actions. They're just things. So actually the force of a signpost is not the words on the, the, the wood or whatever it is, is not the thing itself. It's the agreement that we've made to understand it that way. So the old picture kind of sees uh, rules as like signposts from God, as if they are outside of us and compelling us to behave a certain way. Whereas um, in, the, uh, in the philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein tells us to understand rules as agreements that are part of our social life and their, their force comes from that. And they are essentially public. So understanding in the uh, Augustinian view is a mental process. You know, oh, I'm understanding something right now. I will be understanding for the next 10 seconds in, to this degree of intensity. Uh, Wittgenstein says that, that makes no sense. Understanding, and actually he talks about a lot of uh, apparently mental states are actually not inner states. Uh, so, for example, expecting. He says, what is it to expect somebody? Um, to expect somebody isn't just to have a peculiar kind of sensation. You know, I know what uh, jealousy is, I know what hate is, I know what pain is, and I know what expecting is, and I'm, I'm experiencing expecting right now. Now, expecting is a bunch of behaviors and um, they are not, they are public and open to view. Somebody looking at you can tell that you're expecting. I'll, I'll get into that. That sounds like behaviorism, um, and I'll get into it, uh, how it can be argued that it isn't in a second. Uh, so in the old view, you must be aware of a rule to be able to follow a rule. You can't follow a rule by accident, but in the uh, view of the later Wittgenstein, it can be done unreflectively. And uh, rules coerce you. They're like, as I said, signs from God. Uh, they have a power, they have kind of an objective status. No, rules are our, um, are our products. And they can change, obviously. Uh, like 
the meanings. Uh, uh, so this is something where um, linguists uh, who say that uh, here's where um, I have a pet peeve that I think certain meanings should be reserved. For example, the phrase beg the question. Beg the question for philosophers means claim to prove something while assuming the very thing that you're proving. It's an old phrase, whereas now everybody uses beg the question just to mean what you've said prompts me to, to raise this question, or, or yeah, it means raise this question the way people use it. So what you've said begs the question, are you stupid or, or whatever. That's not what begs the question originally meant. And we have a perfectly good phrase for that. It's raises the question or prompts the question. Where a, what a linguist would say is, sorry, everybody, if people use beg the question to mean raises the question, that's what it means because meaning is use and that's the way it's being used now. In the same way that the word literally now means metaphorically. Like, uh, I don't know if you've seen Parks and Recreations, there's this character played by Rob Lowe who says literally all the time, and he means he literally exploded with anger. And that just means metaphorically, because obviously he didn't explode with anger, uh, he was just very angry. So, but now lots of, enough people use the word literally in that way that it now says in dictionaries, includes metaphorically. Well, that kind of fits with uh, a Wittgensteinian picture of meaning. Uh, meaning is just the way it's used, and if the use changes, the meaning changes. Um, okay. Now, uh, so rules, the discussion of rules is very, um, very much fought over in the philosophical investigation, and it immediately precedes what is usually called the private language argument. Uh, which is perhaps the most discussed and disagreed over part of um, Wittgenstein. There's, uh, we've already talked about uh, another great philosopher of, uh, who, who's uh, slightly later than Wittgenstein, in fact just died recently, Saul Kripke. Um, and Saul Kripke in the early 80s published uh, a book on Wittgenstein on rules and, and private language uh, that created a huge amount of controversy because uh, a lot of Wittgensteinians said, oh, you're not getting Wittgenstein right. Now Kripke said this is just my interpretation of Wittgenstein, but that's one of the, the debates is, you know, okay, Kripke presents a kind of clear argument and says this is Wittgenstein's argument. And of course Wittgensteinians say, Wittgenstein expressly doesn't like clear arguments. He would never say that, you're getting him wrong. So there's this huge debate and, and sometimes Kripke's version is called Kripkenstein. Um, but in the philosophical investigations, um, Wittgenstein denies the possibility of a logically private language. Now, what would a logically private language be? This would be a language, this uh, isn't a language that could, in theory, be translated. It is a language that is logically private. Uh, uh, it, that is, it is, in principle, impossible for anyone to know its meaning. How, how could that happen? Well, if it's about internal states. So, for example, uh, imagine I'm the little prince uh, on an asteroid in the middle of nowhere and I'm thinking about stuff and I feel things and I say, oh, that feeling, hmm, that's a distinctive feeling. I'm going to call that love or hate or, or even pain. Um, and that'll be my term for it. So I collect a bunch of terms, oh, that's a different feeling. I'll call that unease, or I'll call that hunger, or whatever. Um, so I come up with all of these words that are applied to inner states, to feelings that I have. Um, 
th in one sense, this is the sort of picture presented by Descartes, because famously in uh, the Meditations, Descartes argues that what we can know, that what we know, what we have knowledge of, is our own direct experience. What we don't have knowledge of is whether or not there's something beyond our experience causing it. So, for example, Descartes says, I know, I think, therefore I am, I know that I'm having thoughts. That is something that cannot possibly be doubted, so I know that. Uh, whereas I do not know that, you know, when I say I see a tree or I say I see a table or I say I see other people, I don't know if they actually exist. All I know is that I'm, what I do know is that I'm having sensations that I interpret as being caused by something outside of my experience. Um, so this is sort of skepticism that you, that there's a gap between appearance, the, the things that you are directly aware of, and what you think causes the experience. Uh, what, so Descartes says it's entirely possible that I'm just, you know, the only thing that exists in the universe. And all of these things that I think are other people, they're just imaginary. Or they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're just products of my imagination. Because he says, look, you dream other people, but those people don't exist. So maybe when I think I'm awake, it's just another species of dreaming. Um, what Wittgenstein, so, so that's actually one of the uh, philosophical puzzles, is the problem of other minds. And Wittgenstein, he's promised that he will show the fly out of the, the way out of the fly bottle. He will solve some of these apparent uh, philosophical puzzles. And the private language argument is a bit like that. And he says, and, and it's sort of, you can tie it back to his uh, discussion of ostensive definitions originally. So ostensive definitions in the language learning is where you teach other people how words use. Whereas uh, if you were able to um, give yourself names for your private mental states, the reason why that would be logically private is because I could tell you the words that I use, but you would never know what they attach to. So in theory, I could have, I would know what each of these words mean because I can have the feeling, but you can't have the feeling. So you could never know what the words, uh, it would be meaningful for me, but it wouldn't be meaningful for you. That's the uh, theoretical idea of a logically private language. And Wittgenstein says, that isn't even possible in theory. There's no such thing that is possible to be a, a logically private language. Because for the, the, uh, what you're doing in this uh, fantastic scenario of where I'm the little prince naming my own inner life, is I'm doing the ostensive um, ostensive definition internally. It's as if there's a little me inside my mind pointing to, oh, that feeling, and saying, I'm going to call that feeling um, love or hate or whatever. The thing is, though, that I can um, never know that, in order for words, my, my, my word hate to mean something, it has to follow the rules of the language game. But the rules of the language game are uh, necessarily public. That is, it's only, only in being part of a form of life where there's a constant reformation, uh, uh, reinforcement, that you can be said to be following a rule at all. So there can be no language game that is just internal. Like I said, there's no such thing as following a rule just once in the history of the world. You could say the same thing, there's no such thing as a single person following a rule without anybody else. So you cannot have meaningful terms for your inner life. Well then, the obvious response to this is, but we do that 
don't we? Because I know what pain means and I, I know it from feeling pain and that pain cannot be felt by anybody else. Pain, my pain is my own. Um, and here's where uh, Wittgenstein's philosophical psychology comes in. Um, and I'll explain about what a criterion is. So the view that Wittgenstein is rejecting is that my word pain denotes that feeling I get that is entirely private, that pain is a label for a sensation that only I have. So this, on this view, the way I understand pain is first in my own case, and then I say, I see other people behaving in the way that I behave when I'm in pain, and I say, oh, that person I assume is in pain too. Um, so they must be feeling that thing that I feel that I call pain. So you start with your first person case and move to the third person. Um, Wittgenstein says that gets it ass backwards. You start third person and you, um, you then get the first person from that. So if pain is not, as this picture would have it, a, a label for a private sensation, how do we acquire, what, how does pain have meaning? And he says, essentially, it's a particularly, our use of the word of pain language is a particularly sophisticated form of behavior. That is, naturally, as, as animals, we wince or flinch when we're in pain. And when you acquire the language game of pain, feeling, and attribution, so actually, uh, to experience pain is to be part of a language game. You can't even experience pain as pain. There can be something happening with you. There's something going on with you that, you know, uh, we would, that other people would say is pain. But to experience pain as pain, you have to be embedded in a language game and you have to understand the rules of the language game. And when you do, you can use pain talk as a kind of behavior. So talking and saying I'm in pain or being able to recognize pain is displaying mastery of the language game of pain, uh, pain attribution. Um, and so you actually are more likely to see this pain behavior in others. So you learn uh, what pain is first from, um, from the third person case. Uh, if this sounds unconvincing, um, there's, uh, I'll, I'm going to talk about his um, philosophical psychology in a little bit. But first of all, um, let's distinguish, make it clear that he is not a behaviorist, or at least some people would say he really is a behaviorist, uh, but certainly Wittgensteinians would defend him against that claim. All right, so the, what is the criterion of pain? Um, as uh, as uh, Grayling puts it, if you're a behaviorist, all there is to pain is behavior. So behaviorism was this movement uh, in philosophy of mind in sort of the mid-century that has been more or less decisively trashed. There, there aren't really behavioralists in the philosophy of, mi philosophy of mind anymore. But what they said is that uh, in order for uh, us to ever know about mental states, in the same way that we know about anything, it has to be public information. And the only public information that tie to mental states are physical manifestations of, of, of mental states in the forms of behavior. So to a behaviorist, what is pain? It literally is pain behavior, wincing and 
you know, sweating and whatever. The obvious problem with that is people can pretend, so uh, behavior is not sufficient for pain, and people can be stoic. So behavior is not necessary for pain. People can be in pain without showing it. So that seems to be the problem. The alternative view, the sort of Cartesian view, is that uh, the grounds for, um, the external grounds for uh, attributing pain to other people are inductive. That is, we say uh, that wincing and, and other things that are typically associated with pain are good grounds for assuming that um, people are in pain, but they cannot guarantee it. In deductive, uh, in behaviorist says that's what pain is. Pain is literally the behavior. There's nothing beyond that. So if you're displaying the behavior, that's pain, which seems obviously false. The, the other view is to say that, well, it's an indicator, but it's a fallible indicator. So uh, we, we say pain itself is beyond that. Now, from behaviorism, uh, what uh, Wittgenstein seems to take is that the, uh, there is a sense in which there is nothing beyond public indicators um, that pain could be. But on the other side, um, there, uh, it, is, it is not simply once you understand the criterion, uh, once you know the language game of pain use, you will know that it includes the concept of pretending. Behaviorism cannot handle the concept of, behavior, uh, of pretending because the behavior is all there is to pain. Whereas part of understanding the pain, the, the correct use of pain as we use it, is to understand that sometimes people can pretend. So, you, that is incorporated when you have the correct criterion of pain. Okay, so his philosophical psychology is like this. It, is, uh, it sort of moves from the outside in. Uh, and there are some good quotes that Grayling gives. Um, uh, one can, in a quite ordinary and unmysterious way, literally just look and see what state someone is in. And here's the quote from Wittgenstein. Consciousness in another's face. Look into someone's face and see the consciousness in it and a particular shade of consciousness. You see on it, in it, joy, indifference, interest, excitement, torpor, and so on. Do you look into yourself in order to recognize the fury in his face? In other words, that would be if this view were right. Um, if this view were right, here's what would happen. You would look at someone's face and you'd say, oh, he's doing that thing with his face that I know I do when I'm, in, when I'm angry or something. I've, I've been angry and I've looked in the mirror and I said, hey, I'm making that face. Oh, he's making a face like that. So then, wait a minute, what's the feeling I have when I make that face? Oh yeah, it's that one. That would be the mental process that would go through your mind uh, if this was the correct view of understanding mental, sta uh, uh, mental state language. But that's not the correct view, as he says. It is there, uh, the fury, it is there as clearly as in your own breast. Consciousness is as clear in his face and behavior as in myself. We see emotion as opposed to what? We do not see facial contortions and make inferences from them, like a doctor framing our diagnosis. We describe a face immediately as sad. So what you see, you directly experience emotion in others, in uh, just as clearly as you do in yourself. So that tells us that the language game of mental state usage is not as described in the Augustinian picture. We're not, and so we solve the problem of uh, other minds. The problem of other minds is I see behavior that in me is associated with having a, a mind, with thinking, with feeling pain. I see it in other people, but I can never be sure 
that they really have a mind or if it's just a robot or it's just fakery. And um, in this uh, way, Wittgenstein says, that's the problem of other minds, get rid of that problem because that's not what happens. That's not what happens. When you see an, in another's face, you directly see the, um, the emotion. Grief, we would like to say, is personified in the face. This belongs to the concept of emotion. That's just how languages work. Um, then, uh, tied to this idea is uh, challenging the Cartesian picture of certainty. Certainty is um, knowing. Uh, for, for Descartes, certainty is absence of doubt. And for G.E. Moore, famously, uh, who is a colleague of Russell's and uh, actually uh, taught Wittgenstein, G.E. Moore gives this famous sort of expression of common sense philosophy because uh, Carti Descartes in the meditation says it could be possible that we're dreaming all this or that we're just disembodied minds that are being toyed with, with a demon deceiver, kind of an evil god who just gives us all these sensations as if we were. It, it's basically where the idea of the matrix comes from, if they didn't get that from Plato's cave. Uh, that is that there's, um, you know, in the matrix, you, you're not really experiencing what you think you're experiencing, it's just your brain is being manipulated. Well, with Descartes, you don't even have a brain, you just have a, 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 an immaterial mind, and, what, uh, and it appears to be having these sensations for outside, from outside that you think are caused by a, a physical world, but it could be just ideas caused by an evil demon. Um, in response to that, G.E. Moore says, look, let's be common sense about it. That, that, that kind of standard of knowledge is ridiculous. That kind of standard of knowledge means that I can't know that I have hands. But if I know anything, I know that I have hands. So G. Moore is, uh, in this article, is arguing for a, a different standard of knowledge. Whereas um, Wittgenstein, while he sides with the more common sense approach, what he questions about it is he says, you're still using this language of not knowing and you're connecting knowing to uh, absence of doubt. But he says, where there is no doubt, there is no knowledge either. Um, so, uh, and, and we can tie this back to the notion of pain, he says, uh, in what sense are my sensations private? Well, only I can know whether I am really in pain. Uh, here, he's, this is not Wittgenstein's voice. This is the voice of an Augustinian. Well, only I can know whether I'm really in pain. Another person can only surmise it. That's this view. And here's Wittgenstein commenting on that. In one way, this thing that he's just said is false, and in another way, it is nonsense. If we are using the word to know as it is normally used, and how else are we to use it? Then other people very often know that I am in pain. And then he imagines someone responding, yes, but all the same, not with the certainty that I know it myself. And then he responds again, it can't be said of me at all except as a joke that I know I am in pain. What is it supposed to mean except perhaps that I am in pain? So in other words, that's misusing the concept of kn uh, knowing. You just are in pain. It's not something that you know because you cannot doubt it. So you cannot have knowledge where there is no possibility of doubt, which again is actually a complete rejection of the Cartesian view, which says you only know something when you cannot doubt it. That's uh, what he's doing in the meditations. He's looking for something that he cannot doubt so that he can then use that as a bedrock. Okay, a lot of key ideas in uh, Wittgenstein, and they all form this sort of interlocking web. But at, perhaps at bottom is this idea of form of life. Um, and there's a famous phrase uh, that v Wittgenstein uses. He says, it, uh, at a certain point, you've got to stop 
um, asking your why questions. This, this happens if you ever get into a, a conversation with a toddler. A toddler will say, why this? And you will say, because this. And then they will say, but why that? And you will say, because this. And they'll say, well, why that? And at some point you will say, just because. Because I said so. Uh, and Wittgenstein's version of this is when you're looking for the justification, why is this, why is this what we do? There's very fairly quickly you come to the point where you just say, it is what we do. You cannot say any further than point to our form of life. That's how we do things. So justification can never be outside the form of life and say, the reason why the form of life is like this is this. No, there's nothing outside the form of life. He, he says, I dig so far and then at some point uh, my spade is turned, by which means his digging implement, it's as if you hit a rock and you can dig no further. Um, so that sounds like relativism. That sounds like relativism, saying, you know, it's a bit like if, you, if we went to um, certain parts of uh, India where still to this day, it's mercifully rare, uh, sati is still practiced, which is when a, a man dies his wife, uh, and is cremated, his wife is supposed to throw herself alive on the flames and be burned alive too. This was one of the things that the British Empire claimed was so savage about India, which is why it's a good thing that the India was, was subdued by Brits because, you know, we were civilizing them away from this kind of thing. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it was never universal, uh, it was always rare, and it's even rarer now. But, you know, imagine that it's still done in some communities. Uh, and we went to those communities and said, you know, what you're doing is wrong. What they could reply, if you're a relativist, is, well, you're imposing the wrong standards on us. You're not part of our form of life. In our form of life, that's what we do. You cannot come from outside and say, that's wrong. You're making a mistake. You're using, you're using this term wrong from your language game, from your form of life, and you're trying to impose it on our form of life. But in our form of life, that's not how the term is used, because actually this is what is required. So you can see that relativism can be tied to extreme conservatism. And it robs us of the idea of progress, it robs us of the idea of criticism of practices, those kind of things. And if Wittgenstein is advocating an extreme form of relativism, as he appears to be, then that's worrisome at best. But uh, it's also why anthropologists like him, because uh, relativism is much more common in anthropology departments where they are ready to say, you know, uh, female genital mutilation is just a cultural practice that we Westerners can't criticize than, you know, philosophers who say, the hell we can't. We have ideas of universal human rights and we think we can. Um, so that's one uh, area in which um, Wittgenstein gets criticized. But it's a very rich and novel approach. So you can see why people discover the later Wittgenstein and think, wow, where has this been all of my drab philosophical career? This is great. I'm a Wittgenstein, Wittgensteinian going forward. And, you know, he gets new converts every day.